Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 9 of our Let's Learn series for Victoria 3 where we are playing as Serbia, a one state minor power in Eastern Europe wedged between Austria and the Ottoman Empire. Let's go ahead and start it off on a slow speed just to keep the time ticking and we're 15 years into the game. I won't go through a full recap since uh, you know, I think it's clear what's going on. Austria is uh, again for the second time at war with Prussia and Russia. And they seem to be steamrolling the Ottoman Empire, which I'm not sure what's actually going on there. It could be just bugged. Uh, it could be that Austrians really are just strong. And they've opened up a second front against the Russians. We'll see how that goes for them. Uh, but as for us, for Serbia, the last uh, major event at the end of... In the previous episode is that we passed... We moved away from serfdom in 1851 and towards homesteading. So now farmers lay claim to plots of land which they work alongside their hired laborers, as opposed to what we had before was that uh, peasants are tied to their land and must perform labor for their feudal masters. So we made a major move away from feudalism. And that is great in and of itself. The landowners have lost significant Flower, because served them gave them plus 75 percent i believe right or 50 50 percent plus 50 percent yeah they still gain plus 25 percent from peasant levies there you go 25 percent landowner political strength but uh yeah the reality of moving from served them to homesteading has, doesn't really change anything for our economy what it changes it's really about politics and which groups are empowered right now the farmers are empowered but to be really honest, we don't have that many farmers. In fact, we have, I think, just about three buildings maybe that have farmers. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. But the good thing is that homesteading also attracts um, many of these uh, agriculture, other agricultural sector employees or workers to pretty bourgeoisie. So with this change, we were hoping to, first of all, reduce the power, political strength of landowners, uh, increase the power of petite bourgeoisie, and... Uh, actually unlock some other options for us uh, in uh, economic system, for example, and, and trade policy, because they're locked. Uh, they've been locked, uh, and I, th I think also maybe taxation, they're locked uh, until we move away from serfdom. That's kind of the first, first major shift a country needs to undergo to move away from feudalism. So our next goal will be to move away from traditionalism and even if we could move away from any of these laws that are out there now the landowners were just so powerful that they would make it really difficult for us to move away and we can't throw them out of government because that would uh take away at least 50 i mean legitimacy plus their clout so right now landowners alone because they're because our leader is part of landowners that gives us 50 legitimacy and then their clout 16 we're getting about 20 legitimacy from them because it's multiplied by 120. So we're going to have to keep landowners in our government for the foreseeable future. But uh, at least, even though they are in government, we can bring other people in and we can pass or attempt to pass other laws uh, and they will not uh, offer as much resistance. As we have seen when enacting poor laws due to our peasants petitioning the king or our duke, Prince, um, that uh, yeah, it is possible for laws to fail, and we almost failed. Poor, we failed poor laws once because the stall chance was really large, and stall chance when you enact laws depends on the clout of interest groups that are opposed to the enactment of that law. So, basically, this should make it easier for us. Okay, our trade route to Austria, the wine trade route, is suspended as Austria is at war with the Ottomans, and we are a protectorate of the Ottomans still, and. Part of their market. Um, we're not constructing anything as it seems uh, our economy is doing just fine. In fact, we need to hire more people, but uh, our wages are just too high, interestingly. I think what I was thinking yesterday is another thing we could do is uh, actually raise, raise these taxes. And that would push, I think that would push... Uh, the standard of living for peasants down and perhaps push them into and effectively their income down 
and it would push them into becoming laborers instead. I think that would work, but I want to keep taxes as low as possible because it doesn't really matter right now as to whether it's laborers or peasants as long as they're having... Uh, as long as the birth rate... Wow, 1.5% right now. Sorry, I've never seen... How did it get that high? 1.56 right now. Wow. 1.56. We're getting... We're getting 15,000 people, almost 16,000 per year, just from uh, pop growth. Oh, the migration has declined, though. Oh, I think it's because these these uh, provinces have been taken over by Austria. So we're not quite getting that many. Mm, although, actually, no, we're still getting 65 immigrants from Ottoman, Montenegro, Dobrugia, Bosnia. Okay, but it has declined. Interesting. Let's see. Oh yeah, we want to keep this uh, population growth rate as high as possible for as long as possible. And wow, on the average, we're reached 11.7 with lower strata at 10.6. If I'm going to second land, owners, noble privileges deactivated. Okay, so then, they've, yeah, see, so time, some time has passed. Let's see, let's see what's going on here. Some time has passed since we enacted homesteading and the penalty that they had. They used to be very loyal, right? They have a lot of loyalists there, so their approval was high. When we passed homesteading, which they are strongly against, I believe. Uh, land reform, let's find it. Where is the land reform under their ideologies? Land reform, they strongly oppose homesteading. So we just pissed them off really hard. Uh, but because they were so loyal, because we have so many pops that have increased their standard of li living in, over the past 15 years, uh, including aristocrats, they got rich. So they were supporting landowners, they were loyal. So then when they got annoyed, uh, when the interest group became annoyed with us, uh, it only went you know down kind of so much, even though it, it was a minus 20 penalty. That's a huge penalty. But see, landowners opposes the recent change from serfdom to homesteading, minus 19, and that will decay. Uh, see, that will decay over time to zero, but I think over five years, right? And that is another reason why we don't really want to, even if we could right now just pass another law straight away, like traditionalism, which again, they probably like. They're probably not big fans of interventionism. We don't actually want to anything, pass anything just yet because we want, we want to just let things settle. Uh, let things settle, uh, right? Uh, kind of these, uh, the approval of interest groups just need to, they need to forget that we passed a really unpopular law. Everyone needs to calm, calm down. Although the, the, Interest groups like Rural Folk, for example, who are, have now plus 19 approval because they endorsed the recent change from serfdom to homesteading. That will also come down, right? Uh, and so we will lose these bonuses eventually, which have just gotten activated. All right, but let's, let's get to know the Rural Folk. Let's, let's have a look at them. Who are they? So rural Folk are people in the countryside whose political interests are mostly aligned with their agrarian livelihoods. Right? And we have 9.8 thousand people supporting them and giving their you know, number of these pops and their wealth. All right. Uh, they have 5.5% of clout. Uh, so 5.5% of all uh, politically aligned political strength, right? Because some, some pops have political strength, but they're completely, uh, they are politically unaligned. And that means that just gets wasted. It doesn't, it doesn't get divided up in the pie. All right. So they get 5.5%, which is 27.9,000. From wealth, they have plus 27, 9,000. That is the only thing right now that determines political strength. Average wealth of 10.9 plus 2.83 per politically active pop plus 10% from leader trait demagogue. Okay, that's from the leader Danilo Kun Kundak. Um... We're going to have a look who supports the rural folk. Okay, obviously farmers that we have just created, sharecroppers, smallholders, and others who make a stable but scant living producing food or growing cash crops. Most see their interests represented as the rural folk. See, so farmers, there's a Serbian Orthodox, all of them. Actually, we have some Bulgarian Orthodox now as well. Napoleon Kunteko ex exiled uh, from France. Okay, but they work in wheat farms, vineyards, livestock ranches. Uh, and you see pops are separated by culture, religion, uh, uh, and, and workplace. So you see, so for Bulgarian Orthodox, if it's just one difference, they still work in wheat farms. So they work together with these guys. That's why they have the same standard of living. Wow, 
21. And these guys are living the life that, I mean, upper strata have the minimum, ex minimum expected standard of living of 20. Wow, these are prosperous. Are you kidding me? Christ. Northern Survey is paradise. Paradise on earth. The miracle. Oh, this is 10.4. And 10 is the minimum minimum uh, expected uh, base level from uh, middle strata. These guys are rolling in money. These are from Bulgarian Orthodox in vineyards. Yeah, okay, they are impoverished. Yeah, I wouldn't want to work in vineyards. Those things aren't doing particularly well. But yes, we have a lot of loyalists here. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, they're doing really well. So let's have a look. Yep, so population farmers and their political strength is 92,000. That's farmers in Serbia. Right, but only 800 of them support the rural folk. Hmm. 59%. Okay, some support petite bourgeoisie. Landowners, Orthodox Church. Okay. Oh, their clout is growing. The clergymen, peasants even. Some politically uh, politically aligned peasants support uh, the rural folk. Some laborers, I guess those working. No, even those working in iron mines. Yeah. Not tooling workshops, vineyards, food. And just, even though Interesting. Even the ones working in food industries, they see, they still see um, the rural folk interest group as their, as representing their interests. Some shopkeepers. Just in my, I mean, I know it's even three capitalists we got in here. Where do our, our capitalists are? Okay, wait, hang on. Food industries, do we? Oh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, there, yeah, we did change this, huh? I, yeah, see you guys, even. Even I don't always. I remember we changed this, I think, last episode, maybe the episode before, to produce more more liquor. It's actually changing this is fine, but when we change this to produce more groceries, I didn't actually realize we created capitalists. Interesting. I think these are the only capitalists we have. We go to our population chart. Is there a detailed list? We have 300 capitalists now, actually. I are all working in food industries, really. Let's have a look. This is a new class. Capital Captains of industry. New money for a new era. As owners of mines and manufactories, they contribute some of their profits to the investment pool. Their political interests are represented as the industrialists. They're part of the upper strata. They're prosperous. Mostly support industrials. Half, but half are kind of spread all over the place, actually. 20% in Orthodox Church. 14% uh, in rural folk. They only... Pops with adequate wealth can become capitalist. Potential increased with greater wealth and literacy. Pops with culture faces yeah, discrimination. Shopkeepers and engineers have a particularly easy time becoming capitalists. Okay, atmospheric engine unlocked. The atmospheric engine is the first steam engine that has an actual practical application. Okay, so that has spread to us. Knowledge of the Bessemer process has started spreading to us. That's good. Now, there was another comment. I think it was on episode four. Perhaps this person will watch all the way up to episode nine. I think there was another comment before that is you know, people kind of saying, oh, why don't you switch? Uh, why don't you switch, for example, our RM mines or for example, tooling, the tooling workshop, right? Plus 6%. We could actually switch this to wrought iron, all right, and create demand for our iron, etc. I think I've already covered this, but to go over again, and I left a kind of a response in the comments is the reason because is we just let's just have a look how much. This is an example. As we changed our food industries, which to be honest, I didn't actually want to do. I, in fact, I did it uh, inadvertently. Hang on a second. Uh, I just want to double check that. Mm, wait, Southern Serbia. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Immigration is back up to 6,000. Population growth is 1.5%. Excellent. That's exactly what we want. But yes, back to capitalism. Why don't we want to switch production methods to for easy gains? You know, I guess at the start of the game for any nation, there's always a choice for anything like iron mines right now. We could build a new iron mines or to, to, to get more iron, right? And reduce the price. In which the leader of the Orthodox Church has retired from political life. Stoyan Panic, a known jingoist, now leads the interest group. Okay. Music to my ears, event in Northern Serbia. A well-acclaimed troupe of wandering artists arrived in northern Serbia. 
followed by hundreds of requests about our generous government funding. One of their concerts. Followed by hundreds of requests about our generous government funding one of their concerts. Their lyrics? No, you wouldn't understand it. Only the saddest and deepest souls are able to dive into their hearts, wide open before us through those piano notes. Their songs talk about solitude, incomprehension, the lack of a serene place to retreat to. The lack of a serene place to retreat to. They truly capture the sorrows of a teenage soul. How would you understand it? Oh, some of this flavor text is a bit odd if I'm honest. Okay, fund them. Okay, we get 10% prestige. They sound not so great. Uh, to be honest, no, I don't, I don't particularly want 10% prestige. We get 6 prestige. We're comfortably above being an insignificant power. They sound not so great. Yeah. That, those, I didn't like those lyrics anyway. Uh, but yeah, but the, the reason for that is, guys, because we, there is no real benefit for us, I think, from yeah, having more prestige. We're very far off from being a major power. So we, our, our objective is to maintain status of a minor power. Mainly, so we can keep this one uh, declared interest. So we can at least have some some room for diplomatic play. Uh, Netherlands accepted a transfer of states with France. France, Ivory Coast. Netherlands, Dutch, Windward Coast. Okay. So they gave them Ivory Coast. Okay, fine. Not of too much concern for us, necessarily. Oh, Austria is breaking through. Austria has broken through the Russians. Okay. Uh, but sorry, back to our choice here. Do we build another iron mine if we wanted to reduce the price of iron? And actually, we're going to pause because I need to say something. Uh, or do we just switch production method and gain, you know, gain double the iron, you know? And even if we had coal in our, in our own uh, province, right? If we could perhaps even... Increase demand for coal in our province and increase demand for tools on those great things because they will make tooling workshop more profitable. Our our coal mines, if we had any more profitable, or they would they would create trade right now and that would create shopkeepers. Isn't that a good thing? Well, I would say no. Although I haven't said I haven't seen other people kind of in their playthroughs actually talk about this, but I would what I figured out is that no. At the start, if you have the labor to do it, like we have peasants, we'd rather have these peasants. Actually, we'd rather build another iron mine, a full building, and yes, that will take time, that is true. So there's a bit of a delay, it will take 25 weeks. But we would put 4,500 farmers into being laborers, right? Into being laborers, because they employ 4,500. And then we'd create 500 shopkeepers, which are middle class, right? They're, and they're much more spread, in, I think, in their political uh, strength. Right, and there's more of them, and and that would kind of that will give more power to petite bourgeoisie, rather than uh, rather than uh, rather than industrialists, and that is important again because industrialists, you know, the, like the capitalists that support them are they're very progressive, right? They they become really powerful really quickly because they hold they have not a lot of them, they hold a lot of wealth, a lot, and. And and, yeah, and they push industrialist clouds super high. And that, but industrialists are just too progressive. They don't gel very well with landowners or orthodox. It's hard to find, uh, you know, common ground. They have find common ground with intelligentsia, maybe, maybe with armed forces. I kind of think those groups. So, you know, you don't want to inadvertently empower. It is very important who owns the buildings. Like I didn't realize that first few playthroughs, and I would just click. I would always almost like be like, well, well why not? We invented atmospheric engine. I would immediately switch. And I didn't think like, why is this even in the game? I thought this, this is just, you know, this is just worse and this is better. That is not the case if you actually think about it. Um, and in any case, in any case, right now, I don't even want to expand any buildings because I would argue you actually do want to have some peasants in the bank. Why is that? Because we are going to build our military. We can, we can, we, we can station twenty-five battalions of standing army, right? So that's another. Uh, sorry, was it 21,000 men we're going to need, right? We can conscript thir right now 13. So we need another 21 plus 13, like 34,000 people to actually fill in case a war broke out, right? Or if we went to decide to build our military. We need 31,000 people for that. So 21 and 13, 20, 34, right? In reality, we probably need about 50,000 to even attempt to take on Ottomans. We also need, are going to start taking casualties. So we're going to need some replacements. So I would argue, or my thinking, 
is that we're gonna we need to keep this at about a hundred thousand peasants. You know that, that that will be the cost of our independence, and hopefully we win new lands with those peasants, and that will increase our population. But ultimately, oh, migration is up to thirteen thousand. Excellent. This again, some sort of terminal Ottoman Empire. We're increasing our population by a whopping almost thirty thousand a year. This is excellent. Thirty thousand guys. That is, you know. That is excellent. That is excellent. That is exactly what we want. Let's just double check that Orthodox Church is a lot of cloud. It is loyal. It's active. We've done everything to increase our population growth, right? Our taxes are low. We're building up our our uh, gold reserves, which again, many people I heard say, oh, it's a waste of time, etc. Let's go ahead and cancel the wine tax. Because vineyards are, you know, one building that's actually really struggling. So let's try and increase demand for vineyards. Um, I think we're going to just go ahead and remove. We actually create, we're, we're making luxury furniture ourselves. So let's try and help out our domestic industry. Uh, I feel like these we could probably keep. I'm honest, porcelain. Tea is consumed by our middle class. I'm going to keep a tax on opium because I don't want anyone to consume opium. Right? And develop. I mean, we're not. We're nowhere near developing a uh, obsession. I think we're being bankrolled by someone as well, aren't we? So there's again that bug with the running horses. And, uh, no, actually, we're not being bankrolled. We're just grown our GDP and therefore increased our minting. Right? We did. We got the central bank, central banking unlocked as well. So we're minting uh, proportional to our GDP plus twenty percent. Some tariffs, consumption taxes. Actually, to be honest, they don't actually add anything right now. I'm going to go ahead and remove consumption tax on luxury clothes as well. Oh, it's because we're not constructing anything. That's why. That's why. That's fine. We're not constructing anything. Let's remove those taxes. I'll keep a tax on opium. I don't want, I want to reduce that consumption. And this is a good thing. We're building up gold reserves that will, that will pay for our eventual confrontation with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so okay, let's keep this on Speed three. Let's have a look. Is there anything we can actually build? Perhaps could we build fertilizer plants? No, those would be unprofitable. Explosives. What was the last thing we built? I think were glassworks, and you know those aren't doing too hot. The artillery foundry. Uh, yeah, not doing too hot either. Although to to do something about that. Okay, we do have mobile artillery here. We have one battalion of mobile artillery. We have line infantry, so we could. We only have two line infantry. We could just recruit some people into our army. Let's think about that. Let's actually yeah, go over while we have time. Okay, our uh, private sector is building logging camps. And sorry, one other thing I was going to say, and the reason I paused the game just a little bit earlier is because I was going to say... One thing that, again, I'm, I pointed this out before, but I'll point out again, we weren't constructing anything, and neither was the private sector. But I wanted to point out the fact that when the construction sector is not constructing anything, the wages still need to be paid. So the construction sector is much like any other government building. It puts a constant strain on your uh, budget um, balance, right? And that is important. I didn't actually realize that. Right? So even when the private sector is constructing right now and all of the construction goes to the private sector, they only pay for the goods. They do not pay for the wages. Right? You can see that here. Uh, goods for government building. Okay, we're buying paper for government administration university. They're fine. For government wages, construction sector. Right? We're not constructing anything. Only the private sector is constructing. But even if the private sector was not constructing anything, and interesting to me, you know, what I kind of find a little, you know, quite interesting in this game, is that employment never drops in the construction sector. Now, I think that mechanically, the reason that happens, so even when we're not building anything for a prolonged period of time, uh, the reason I think this actually happens is because government buildings um, pay wages based on normal wage. So kind of, they never underpay. They always pay the average wage of the, of the, of the uh, province or even of the economy. So there is no reason for these guys to leave, right? So you see, so even when there's no one buying these goods, no one constructing anything, uh, the wage never drops. The, the employees never leave. Even if you know other jobs grow, then the average 
uh, a wages gets pulled up and someone always gets employed here. You see normal wage in Serbia, 298. Base wage in construction sector, 298. Due to normal wage in Serbia being 298. Wages are decreasing since last week. Okay. Um, so there we are. That's just something to know. That's also why you don't want to construct. Someone I think told me before. Uh, okay, I talked about why we don't switch to iron frame buildings. But why don't we build a, you know, another one? Even if we can afford to temporarily speed up construction. And it does help your... Uh, it does help your uh, GDP or growth because you're creating demand for wood and fabric. Um, but, you know, you actually want to be quite careful. You want to engineer a really nice steady rise. Not sure what this kink was. I think it was maybe homesteading, actually. Uh, this nice steady rise in uh, GDP. Like, you don't want, uh, you know, ups and downs. And, and the reason you don't want ups and downs apart from anything else it's because pops get radicalized much easier than they get to loyalists. So if we went ahead here, right, and you start switching taxes for like a couple of years, you go to high, really high and then you start to go really low. What happens is that when you go to really high taxes, uh, the standard of living of pops drops. And when it drops, I think the base number is 66, but like, I don't quote me on that. But it's something like 66%, maybe even more of the pops that have had their living standard of living drop become radical although actually they become less loyal so if they were loyalists they become neutral if they were neutral they become radical right whereas on the way up when you switch back to high taxes but right, that will actually improve their standard of living right and all things being equal it should it, it pretty much does the same right so for example right now if we move this up we tax our peasants at one pound per person as opposed to 0 0.4 pounds per person right so you think like okay the standard of living goes back up they should all become more loyalist but no, only I think about a third, again with some modifiers, become more loyalists. But the reality, Otto von Bismarck unfortunately exiled from Prussia. Okay. Uh, okay, landowners are actually happy with us again. Okay, let's have a look at that for a second. Just Greek Venetian rivalry declared. United yeah, States of America bankrolling us. Perfect. That's fine. So we've explained about taxes and, and, and just going up and down. And that's why you don't want to do that with the construction sector as well. You don't want to build things, then stop building. Right, you don't want to kind of build things quickly with a really like with a really advanced or like with a say a more advanced method. You would rather stay on a less advanced method and build. You constantly build something, constantly progress. Let's go ahead and pause because we actually spent quite a lot of time talking, not constructing anything. I don't really like the situation that there is nothing being constructed. I am happy that our private sector has helpfully built us a logging camp. That was a smart decision. Right? Yeah, bring the logging price. Price of logs a little down. Uh, what can we build? Is there anything we can build? Okay, motor industry is obviously too early. Fertilizer plant would be nice because we need an explosives factory ultimately to produce munitions. Yeah, we're going to need to import lead. Lead and sulfur. Sulfur? I know Wallachia. Wallachia has sulfur and coal. We can put that in. What about lead? Who has lead? Um, uh, lead. Would we... Okay, from the Russian market. It doesn't really matter about productivity, but the Russian market we could import it. From Austrian. Austria, Austria-Hungarian market we could import. Okay, so we will find lead. So we can build a domestic arms industry. We can do it. I mean, the first stepping stone would be to build fertilizers. Or an alternative to just build explosives straight away. But. We do need ultimately, we do need fertilizers now. Market as well. Uh, so fertilizer factory would be nice. And it, there is actually kind of an internal uh, no, domestic economy loop. That's profitable, except we need to import sulfur. Mm. Yes, we could also get fertilizers by building another livestock branch. But the thing is, fabric and meat aren't that expensive. Yeah, I mean, there is maybe scope for one more. We'll see if our private sector actually builds one. But otherwise, we are okay. There's nothing really to build. So let's just go ahead and continue building up our gold reserves really isn't a bad thing. 
we could start building up an army, help our uh, help our arms industry and our artillery industry, for example, in particular. But that will put a constant strain. Let's see. Once we get our gold reserves something like seventy five percent or more, then then we'll start building up our military. So um, yeah, and let's actually talk about military. In fact, but before we do that, let's just go ahead and talk again about landowners. So you see, again, some time has passed while we were talking, and they slowly, their happiness, right? You see, law changes. They, 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 it was minus 20 at the start, minus 19 when we checked. Now it's minus 14. So it keeps going down. Now there's so many loyalists, you see, so already they're happy with us. You know, they've forgotten just 18 months later, you know, after we, you know, got, you know, decreased their clout by uh, removed that. 50% bonus to their clout. Uh, fine, you know, they, they get over it. That's, so we, we're going to wait a little bit. You know, and the next thing we want to do is we want to move away to traditionalism. How do we do that, though? Okay, we need landowners support agrarianism. Industrialists endorse it. Rural folk endorse it. Deary me. Deary me. You know what else we could do? We could actually... Throw bourgeois petit bourgeoisie out of government for now. And maintain a righteous government. Because we don't need petit bourgeoisie. For anything else. Other than potentially an army model. Hereditary bureaucrats. Oh, okay, we've discussed it last time. right? I think we came to the conclusion that we don't really want anything. Do we want religious schools? No, we don't want to raise literacy just yet either. We want to maintain the population growth rate as high as we possibly can. Now, police. Just so we don't waste time with the legislature. Do we want... So last time we talked about local police and dedicated. Uh, local police just helps landowners. So we don't really want that. And reduces state penalties from turmoil. That would be if pops got really angry en masse in a particular state. I think what's better is dedicated police force. It would cost a bit of bureaucracy. But it would decrease turmoil if there ever was any later on. And minus, it would give us minus 5% radicals from standard of living decreases. And in the event of a war, right, after the initial euphoria passes, we are going to start getting radicals. Right? There will be there will be some uh, standard of living decreases <laughs> for sure coming coming soon. So we could right now actually get petite bourgeoisie, armed forces, and landowners. Get all of these guys happy. We could pass this. Just just to have it. We won't upgrade it to any, you know, any any further up. This is a good to kind of future proof our country. Hmm. Land based taxation, no consumption based. We do want to move away from traditionalism. This would be nice. But who actually supports what? Let's just have a think here. Agrarianism. And the reason, guys, just to recap again, it's been maybe like some time since you watched the previous episode where we've gone over this in great detail. But traditionalism, I mean, the biggest thing, I mean, investment pool, I don't like, yes. But frankly, our economy is doing fine. We don't we don't have a deficit of investments. we got nothing to build, right? Right now, no one's building anything. So this investment pool contribution, right? You can see our investment pool here under budget assets. Investment pool is, uh, you know, keeps growing. That's okay. And when we have things to build, you know, maybe we'll build things. But that is, I'm not so concerned about right now. I actually quite like the minus 25% bureaucracy population cost multiplier. Because we're already at 70. We only have 25 bureaucracy to play with, right? And this will go up, this minus 30 a bureaucracy that we need to manage our population. But it's it's quite easy to increase bureaucracy, so I'm not too concerned. But it is a nice bonus. Saves us some money in the short term by not having to build a second uh, government administration district. Taxation um, capacity, we also have plenty of room. But the biggest issue is the minus 15% market access price impact. And that means basically we can't access like the higher prices in the overall Ottoman market. This would be really nice to get rid of. Because even if we leave the Ottoman market and then join the Austrian one or Russian market, this is will constantly, you know, haunt us. So this is nice to remove. Um, 
but let's at least, I mean, intervention, agrarianism, that's like one step up. A rural economy emphasizing agricultural development and community. That will allow us to subsidize all sorts of uh, okay, agriculture, ranches, plantations, infrastructure, and trade centers. Not manufacturing buildings, unfortunately, which would be nice to actually emphasize. Uh, sometimes it's worth subsidizing something like arms industries in case it's not uh, fully employed because then you pay the subsidy to the arms and artillery, in, for example, industry or munitions, but your army gets really cheap you know, rifles. A net that is actually less expensive. Aristocrats, yeah, the investment pool would you know, right would rise, so they would have much more money from the private sector. That's nice. We would have to split with private construction if we're building two buildings, right? If we're building government money being spent on a building and private sector's building would split our construction half-half. That's okay, it's not too bad. So agrarianism would be a nice stepping stone. Of course, interventionism would be even nicer. Then we can subsidize everything, including arms industries. 50% construction. Yeah, so it's pretty much the same as this, except there are no... Yeah, there are no investment pool. Okay, well, we don't get plus 50% from farmers or aristocrats. We probably have, like, more farmers and aristocrats right now, to be honest. We only have 300, uh, three or 400 capitalists, right? So this would actually be better in terms of investment pool, I think, on balance. But again, I'm not that concerned about investment pool because our economy is fine. We pretty much built everything. We don't even know what we're going to build. So how do we get interventionism? Two interest groups support this law. Industrialists and trade unions. So we need an agrarianism. Two interest groups support this law. Landowners and rural folk. But landowners support traditionalism more. That's why we can't switch to it, right? The chance of, agrar the chance of agrar agrarianism can be... Enacted must be above zero through the support of an interest group in government, a political movement, or the rulers' ideology. Yeah. So basically, we need to bring in industrialists into our government. There is no way we can squeeze in a fourth... A fourth... Excuse me, a fourth interest group in here. No way. So we're going to have to throw someone out. That will have to be petite bourgeoisie. Even then, we're going to have to deal with an unacceptable government for some time while we're passing that law at least. Hmm. That is not good. An unacceptable government gives us minus two opposition interest group approval, plus 50% enactment time, and plus 25% radicals from standard of living decreases. That shouldn't hurt us, but the 50% enactment time will hurt us. Oh, so we need to maybe wait until one of the leaders could die and we could get a leader that actually supports agrarianism. Ah, yeah. Like some reformer or something. Yeah, so for now though, let's just wait. Let's perhaps pass dedicated police force while we have while we have petite bourgeoisie in government and then we'll take them out of government so that it's... Because right now it's contested. Contested is not so bad, but it's nice to be righteous. Uh, hmm. Mm, in fact, I'm just gonna... Let's just leave it then. Okay, let's just... Hmm, I don't know. Should we pass? Should we pass? Dedicated police force, guys? Local police force political movement. Oof. Let's just go ahead and pass dedicated police force before people start making all sorts of movements. Dedicated police force. Let's go ahead and pass it. In anticipation of troubles ahead. Political movement disband. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and pass. And then we'll remove Petit Bourgeoisie from government. Okay, population growth is up. GDP going up. So we are 15 years, a little bit more into the game. We have gone from, what, 250,000, basically? To one and a half million. That is... Uh, that's four, six-fold increase, and we went from 0 0.3, so that's four, almost five times per capita, right? Remember, guys, we used to be like 170 here. We're 80. We are doing very well. We need more and more and more peasants. That is excellent. Yeah, we need more people. 
Now, let's talk about our military. We've got to start planning out how we're going to defeat or at least take on the Ottomans. They got 300 battalions with 3,000 strength. Not too bad. There used to be something like 5,000, right? Austro-Hungarians, 2,500. Two okay, that's, I think they're recovering after the war. I think they've been yeah, they're done with their war. Russia and Russia. Russia. Yeah, Russia is 6,000. Objection. Have a look at diplomacy. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Sneeze. Um, improve relations. Okay, there's no point in improving relations with anyone. We've improved relations with everyone we know. What can we do? Can we get an alliance? Montenegro. He's not with Russia. Why not with Russia? Why, why don't you want an alliance with Even if we owe you an obligation, we're still at minus 70. Deary me. What about France? Can we get any great power? Minus 86. Minus 72. And it's because base flex amounts 100. So power pro army power projection is something we could change. Ideological similarity of our governments, attitude, relations, uh, great power versus minor power. So a bit more prestige, maybe it could help us. Yeah. Greece. Why doesn't Greece want to ally with us? Oh, we owe them an obligation. Minus five. Could get allied with Greece, but does that help us? No, not really. So, basically, what that means is that we're going to have to take the Ottomans on our own. Or at least at least attempt to take them on our own. It is possible that even the, without an alliance, one of the powers will sway onto our side. Uh, but let's see. Browsing speech captivates the public. Advanced event for enactment of dedicated police force. Oh, that's 64%. This afternoon, Mayodrag Lesyanin, leader of the Petite Bourgeoisie, delivered a fiery speech advocating for the enactment of dedicated police force. Making an appearance before the public in Belgrade's main square, Miodrag Lysianin, powerful Miodrag Lysianin's powerful rhetoric left even his most embittered political opponents impressed. Excerpts from the speech are already being circulated across Serbia, fanning the fires of an already roaring debate. Okay, this should ease the path to reform greatly. Or, shall we say, perform performances like these reflect well on Miodrag Lysianin and his cause. 10% enactment chance. 25% popularity. Okay, excellent. So that would... Popularity of the leader... I'm going to... Actually increases... I uh, see the popularity of a character measures the willingness of pops to follow them. Popularity can have different effects depending on the character's role. And plus 5% interest group attraction. So let's get... Let's get just 10% because we already have 30. That's good enough. All right, we'll up this to 40%. That means the advance chance is actually 58%, right? This end of discussion factor. The presence of an end of discussion factor represents that interest groups in government consider further discussion of the merits of the law currently being enacted no longer useful. The lower this factor gets, the more negative pressure is it puts on the possibility of the enactment may advance or stall. Okay, so it seems like the more events pop off without actually switching to the next phase. Let's track this actually, Let's see what happens next time. I wasn't, to be honest, aware even before I started this series. I never noticed this end of discussion factor. Well, let's have a look. I think this means there's one event. So like right now we were in an advanced event. So it wasn't a success, but it was an advance. I think that means if you pop advance once, it probably decreases by 10%. So you can't pop advance more than 10 times in a single phase. Let's see if it carries over between phases as well. But anyway, yeah, it's good that we now have Petit Bourgeoisie will hopefully rise in clout from 13. Let's follow them up. Oh, sorry, that's landowners. Pardon me. Uh, yeah, Petit Bourgeoisie. Yeah, they should start rising. Let's, uh, go ahead and unpause. Mass communication unlocked. Mass communication is the easy spread of information utilizing technologies such as the newspaper. Plus 10% authority. Okay. What are we researching, by the way? Yeah, we're researching central archives. Interesting. Plus one max home affairs. Unlock secret police. Oh, we, hang on. Unlocks secret police law in internal security. Very interesting. Aren't we 
Oh, sorry, secret police. Sorry, I'm confusing guys. Sorry, secret police is part of uh, home affairs. Uh, so internal security. That's actually a nice one to get as well, right? As we talked last time. Because that would give us minus 10% political movement radicalism. And it will allow us to suppress interest groups better. Uh, so that's a good one to get. And that will give us more bureaucracy for the same... So for just one government administration. Oof. Uh, you know, by just using more paper. Although... Although, yeah, I was going to say the argument here could be is that instead of improving the method and consuming more paper for more bureaucracy, we could actually just expand the government sector and use the same argument I said before, right? That uh, it's better to employ more people into aristocrats, bureaucrats, clergymen, clerks. However, the argument doesn't hold the same way as... Uh, and let's go ahead. Dedicated police force has attracted new supporters, increasing enactment success chance by 15%. Okay, excellent. Let's just check the end of discussion factor. Yep, let's see there is an advance event that went from 0 0.9 to 0 0.65 and it actually goes up. Okay. okay, let's follow this. But anyway, so we come back to this. The argument here doesn't hold the same way because a government administration is a government-owned building and building a second one, yes, it's nice that it puts out, you know, makes our peasants into clerks, clergymen, bureaucrats and aristocrats, uh, but it costs us almost a thousand, a thousand to maintain that. That is a lot. So it's much better to increase the, in this case, the production method and just gain extra 15 bureaucracy. And we need to be careful with these institutions we're going to enact, you know, preemptive, preemptively, as I say, because 10 seems like a really tiny amount. When I started playing, I thought, okay, I just maxed out my institutions all the time. But just understand 50 bureaucracy, 50 bureaucracy costs us 1,000, right? That is a lot. That is a lot. Because if we look at our barracks, Five, sorry, four battalions cost us 500, right? So eight, so it's the equivalent cost. Of one administration building is eight battalions in our army, for example, right? A university even costs us 800. Perhaps we should build another paper mill. That's what I think. Uh, actually, wouldn't hurt. Yeah, let's think about that in a, in a bit. I think we can go ahead and build it to be... Oh. Okay, we have a... Again, we have an option here. We could switch, but again, for the same reason that I don't want to create capitalists. We could just build a paper mill, to be honest. We got the budget. Uh, let's, let's see if our private sector builds it. We're doing fine for now. Let's see. I, ho I hope our private sector builds some paper mills. How they're pretty productive. Sent. Okay, artillery doing well. Okay. Fine. Let's see. Let's just hope that that happens. Now we'll leave it at speed two. And now we finally let's got a. We have to plan out what is our strategy. Like we're getting we're almost twenty years into the game. I think we do want to maintain monarchy and all this and complete this event. I want. I want to see what it actually provides and it's at least kind of thematic and immersive. And right. And and our king is doing a great job again. Our GDP guys just love. I love this. Mm. It's fine. A little bit. I mean, we do have to kind of, uh, uh, right, get literate at some point. But the longer it takes, the better. Oh, I love this population growth rate. I just can't get over it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I've never seen one and a half percent. God, this is so good. Okay, twenty-five thousand right now. We're getting twenty-five thousand per year. I wish that was thirty thousand. No. Uh, I love it. Love it. Um. But think about how, what is the best military strategy for us, right? So research. Okay, we're then doing postal savings. Okay, that's fine. But we need to think in terms of our military. How do we take on the Ottomans, right? Navy on the left hand side doesn't really matter. It's all about this here. Our field works gives us plus ten percent army defense. That's good. That's gonna spread in ten to fifteen months. We'll have this. That's good. Right, so we need to be better equipped. So that means field works is modifying the terrain where the battle is held, thus giving soldiers greater protection. Okay, so it looks like trenches. Yeah. So once we learn to dig trenches, we don't need to just attack southern Serbia, grab it. Maybe it's just one state. Yeah. If we just grab southern Serbia, that would be like a good first step. It's our homeland. So our culture loves it, right? We'll fix its taxation capacity. It's got plenty of infrastructure. It's got 873,000 of population, right? Which are, 
about 500,000 Serbs. This is by far 300,000 Serbs, 135. Yeah, so this is by far the biggest step we can take towards unifying the Serbian people. So we'll get half a million of population, right? They're actually having migration in, so this will be a massive boost. What is the GDP? 335,000, but we'll boost that easily to a million, I'm sure. In terms of buildings, again, still backward, like, this will be great for us, right? We're going to have lots of pops, lots of labor. Oh, and they have coal. Coal will allow us to, and we have iron. Coal plus iron equals steel. That means we can have steel tools. Perfect. And we have lead, a necessary ingredient for munitions. So once we get this, you know, our arms industries will be much stronger. So we just need to, need to wrestle southern Serbia away from the Ottomans, and then we can take on... Maybe the Ottomans again for Bosnia and Montenegro. And then we can take the Austrians. But we have to get Southern Serbia. Discord within the landowners. Advance event for the enactment of dedicated police force. An influential faction within the landowners has grown frustrated with their co-members' neutrality on the topic of dedicated police force. Themselves in favor of the law, they have now resolved to form a separate political faction intent on passing it. How can you all stand idly by and watch the world pass before your eyes? Have you no sense of honor, of duty to your fellow man? I say nay to such lack of ambition. And I dare say I am not alone in this. Okay, with their support, the bill shall pass. So landowners get members fly, me member flight, minus 5% interest group attraction, and we get 15% enactments chance. Excellent. The armed forces extend an open hand to these mavericks. Okay, landowners lose 15%, armed forces gain 10%. Do we want our armed forces to be stronger? Let's actually have a look while we're paused. Let's just have a look since we are about to discuss our military anyway. Let's have a look at the armed forces interest group, right? Who are they? Professional soldiers and others whose interest is are tied strongly to the country's military. Pretty straightforward. Ooh. Let's have a look at this. Their leader is Republican, Nikola Maricic. The leader seeks to establish a republic ruled by elected officials. <sighs> he opposes monarchy. Interesting. Sir. Hmm. Do we really want to empower this? They are loyalists. So this group believes each citizen should pay their dues to fund the vital functions of the state. So that means... Yeah, they, they love per capita taxation, proportional taxation and graduated, neutral towards land. We are going to have to go to these one of these taxations eventually to pay for our army. They are patriotic. That means they endorse dedicated police force, which we are passing. Strongly endorse militarized police force. Um, but for that, we need mass surveillance anyway. They endorse secret police, which we're probably, we're probably going to adopt. And they endorse Outlaw Descent which we have. Okay, so we're on board with Patriotism. We're on board with Loyalist. Jingoist. So they endorse Mass Conscription and strongly endorse Professional Army. Okay, we are on board with this. Colonization is kind of irrelevant. This group believes in an aggressive foreign policy and maintaining an army to back it up. I don't like Republicanism. Elected bureaucrats they want. They don't like hereditary bureaucrats. Now, uh, possible, possible. We can get maybe on board with this. They want a presidential republic. Well, that is some far, some distance away. They have 10% cloud. We have both uh, traits activated. Veteran consultation plus 10% military research speed. Perhaps we could get plus 20%, right? If we, if we got that cloud to 20%, we would get plus 20% to military research speed. And that would be nice for us as we're about to discuss what technologies we need. We're going to start researching, I think, military technologies pretty soon. Technological advancements are changing the face of war, but we can only make use of them if we understand how. Fortunately, those of us with first-hand experience should have an idea. And they have patriotic fervor, plus 10% to offense and defense, which again, if we make them loyal, sorry, they're already loyal, if we make them powerful, this will double. No matter how brilliant the strategy and how advanced the weapons, some battles can only be won with hard work and guts. Soldiers who truly believe in what their country stands for will fight bravely regardless of the odds. So we do want to get armed forces stronger. This is only for five years, right, this modifier. But still, 
we already have 57% 50 50 success chance. So let's get 10% enactment success chance. All right. And make land landowners lose uh, political uh, strength or political pop attraction and, 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 and funnel that political strength towards the armed forces. That is the best choice. Okay, so we... Part of our military strategy is we need to get armed forces to be powerful. I mean, it's quite an easy thing to do, I would think, because all we need to do is build up our army and all the officers and servicemen are likely to support armed forces. So let's go ahead and unpause at speed two and go back to plotting. So field works is going to spread. That's going to give us 10% army defense. Then really what would be, you know, in an ideal world, we need the skirmish infantry that's 25 offense 35 defense 10 morale loss uh okay 25 35 plus 10 right versus line infantry can we get uh so they have yeah so skirmish infantry has 25 offense so 25 percent more 35 defense versus 25 percent decent defense plus same morale loss okay Organizing two to four ranks of soldiers to maximize their firepower. Yeah, and with those bonuses from uh, from military being percentages, we really want skirmish infantry to take on the Ottomans. Then, if we had fifty battalions of skirmish infantry, like we actually stand a chance. Light infantry, which is positioned in a loose formation, allowing a high degree of flexibility. Yeah, so we're gonna need this. I think we're gonna need skirmish infantry. Let's unlock this. We're going to need logistics to get 20% conscriptable battalions. Because so, we're going to need to enlist as many men as we can. Yeah, but to get skirmish infantry, we need munitions. To get munitions, we need percussion cap. I'm going to go ahead and queue this up into the so shift click it and queue up percussion cap so we can unlock munitions plant. And rifling, which will allow us to build a lot of rifles with a single... Uh, with a single arms industry building. Let's get munitions plants. Then we're going to get general staff for skirmish infantry. And then we'll get logistics. So this is three years. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we might, have, right? we might have to drop postal savings because this is 10 months. So one year, three, 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 and three. So this is 12, this is 13 years of research. So 1856, 1866, which will be 30 years into the game. 1866, we should have all of these researched. We might get, we might be lucky and get the spread in our land technology as opposed to uh, naval. Um, yeah, so this is what we need. However, before we, another, uh, another impediment, I don't know, or block that we have of adopting skirmish infantry is that in our laws, our army, sorry, in our laws, our army model is currently peasant levies. The army's main force comes from conscripted infantry with zero to basic training, right? And that means we can mobilize 14 battalions, gives our landowners again 25% political strength, gives minus 25% military goods cost. That's actually quite nice. Although they're cheap, to be honest. So it's good for now, because we can maintain whatever troops we have now for cheaper. And he has plus 25 barracks max level, and we only have one state, so it is important for us. That means for us, that that's basically defines the size of our standing army, is 25. 25 maximum conscription limit. Okay, that is, doesn't matter to us right now that, well, that much, I want to say, because... We are actually limited to only 14 conscription centers, which is below this cap of 25 because of our population. And our population is 5.6% of our population. That's 256,000, right? Um, yeah. So, and this is, comes from 4% from peasant levies. And we get plus 20%, plus 20%. We're going to get another 20% from... Uh, uh, from what was that tech the lot from logistics in the end so yeah so that is not necessarily bad for us uh, so is it peasant levies 
Like it doesn't affect us yet. I mean, if we could get, if we grow our population enough, we could get 25 maximum conscription and 25 barracks max level. We could field an army of 50 with a reduced cost. So that's good, right? 10% 10 10 morale loss. That's not good. It does restrict recruitment of infantry to irregular infantry and line infantry. Restricts recruitment of artillery to basically mobile artillery. Dedicated police for has successfully progressed. So we actually didn't pay attention last time. It was that end of discussion factor. Okay, so it does persist. So we had another, another event. All right, so we had three events. So that has brought down end of discussion to 0 0.5. All right, so you see... 32 times 2, and then times half. So our success chance now... Yeah, success chance is high because of these extra events. But the advanced chance is the base success times 2, and then times a half, so back to 32. Okay, interesting. Okay, we'll, we'll follow that through next time we pass a law as well. But for now, so sorry to keep switching back and forth. So we sorted out research. Go back to peasant levies. Yeah, so peasant levies basically allows us only hustlers, mobile, mobile artillery is okay. That's not bad, right? Because what unlocked Napoleonic warfare unlocked mobile artillery. Where's the next artillery? Breach loading artillery, breach loaders for artillery, found a shrapnel artillery. Yeah, that's right. So if we got shell gun, which unlocks smooth bores for artillery foundry to produce more, and leads to breach loading artillery. So this is way like 13 years. 16 years away we are from breach loading artillery and that will give us shrapnel, shrapnel artillery right so that's fine the fact that peasant levies doesn't let us um, build a lot of uh, artillery is okay right it doesn't let us build great infantry so if we didn't have skirmish infantry i guess what we could do is what, right now our best unit is mobile artillery, right? 35 offense, which is what we're going to be doing, is we're going to go on an offense, and 20% and 20 defense. 8 morale loss, 20% kill rate, 15% devastation. High degree of mobility to allow quicker positioning. So we need a lot of artillery. Our, our army, in fact, should be, should have a lot of artillery in it. Right? So that, uh, yeah, because this is our best offensive unit. Interesting. Could make like an artillery heavy army. I do believe there's a penalty if if I think it's artillery and cavalry, if together they are something like I think if they outweigh the infantry in the army, then you get a penalty. I don't know. I'm not sure. I think they can be equal. So you can have like five and you can have more. But we'll have a look in a second. Um hmm. So we could build a lot of artillery, and peasant levies allows us to build it cheaply because it will be minus 25% military goods cost. So morale boost. Hussars, they are at 15 offense and defense, 10 morale loss. Light and mobile cavalry armed with sabers. Okay, they're kind of worse than line infantry, to be honest. We don't want any hussars anyway. So we could... I guess, yeah, so the strategy with peasant levies would be to get our military interest group to become powerful. Right, research some of those techs, which, uh, I mean, really then, none of this actually matters. None of these. 10% army defense matters. Right, that would improve defense of mobile artillery and line infantry. Then logistics should, to be honest, be the first thing we should research. Perhaps we should do that, in fact. Mm. In fact... That is exactly what we do. Let's go logistics first, because we want these twenty percent conscriptable battalions. If the war breaks out earlier, this is actually the first sec we need. And then now, uh, in the future, it would be nice. It would be nice, but it will, it's going to take a long time to get the percussion cap, build munitions plant, and to and to get munitions plant. Right, we need explosives, and to get explosives, we need a fertilizer factory, and we need to import sulfur. So, to be honest. Relying on skirmish, having skirmish infantry is uh, not only saying it can't be done. That means the war will happen in around 1870, right? But if it breaks out earlier, we need logistics for extra conscriptable battalions. Uh, and we go with peasant levies, right? If we had to like fight a war right now, we'd, just, we'd have to build a lot of mobile artillery then. Hmm. 
what are our other options? Now, we get a lot of support. Professional army, right? That sounds good. Because we're trying to fight a big army with a small army. So what do we get? The army consists of well-trained professional regulars. Yes, please. And by the way, moving away from serfdom, I think... Uh, allowed us to move to this because we are under with serfdom i don't think we could go to professional army i think maybe i'm lying i don't know this allowed no actually no okay maybe that's not true popular playwright endorses reform in the midst of the debate surrounding dedicated police force one of the countries is leading playwrights strongly associated with the armed forces has staged a widely acclaimed play who's politically laden Theme makes no secret of the author's desire for the law to be passed. Now we know this event. It's always, I think, best. Let us ensure the play gets a wider international audience. Plus 20 prestige. All right, we only have 65, so plus 30% prestige again makes us comfortably above, comfortably above the threshold for insignificant power, and maybe even helps us in our diplomacy. So we're number 20 in the world. Not bad. Now. Let's go back again to discussing army models. Yeah, so here we are with peasant levies. To be honest, um, hmm, sorry guys, we're actually coming up on the hour from all our discussions, so I just want to... Okay, fine, let's just... Sorry guys, I'm not sure if my voice was lost because I, I just all tabbed to see how far we are into the episode and we just uh, went over the hour already, five minutes past the hour. I was saying maybe it's worth to postpone this to the next episode, the discussion of professional army, national militia, mass conscription. I think let's do that because it's going it's to take more than five or ten minutes to actually go over the various army models and decide for what is going to be best for us and the most you know, attainable in the next 10, 15 years uh, when we're going to have to face the Ottomans. So, yeah, thanks a lot for watching. I'm going to end the episode here. Thanks a lot for watching. Um... Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you're learning things still. And I hope it's uh, getting more and more interesting because the showdown with Ottomans is coming, guys. It's coming soon. Uh, yeah, really hope to see you in the next episode then. Bye.